Members. Point of order, the Honourable John Biscard. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to draw to your attention, if I may, a question to the Chair of Local Government and the Environment Committee by Gareth Hughes on the 27th of April 2010 and a question to the Chair of the Law and Order, order Committee order, by the Honourable order, Clayton order. Cosgrove. I fail to see with what uh, that's got to do with order in the House right now. Uh, I've simply said the House is coming to questions to members and the members talking about questions uh, from some previous time. I fail to see how that's going to do with the order right now. It may become relevant, but I don't see it being relevant right now. We come to questions. Point yeah. of order, the Honourable John Bissell. The reason it's relevant, Mr Speaker, as you're aware, uh, my office tried to submit questions uh, early this morning to, to the, to, for, for oral answer, and some of those questions were declined, Mr Speaker. And the questions that we tried to submit and declined were based on the questions that had been previously submitted and accepted by Gareth Hughes on the 27th of April 2010 and by the Honourable Clayton Cosgrove on the 17th of February 2010, sir. And I'm asking for a ruling from you that if it was good enough for the questions that were, that were accepted from Gareth Hughes and the Honourable Clayton Cosgrove, why wasn't it good enough for questions that were submitted by my office based on the precedents that had already been established by those two questions, Mr Chair? Why were, we, why were those questions declined? The member's point of order is indeed reasonable. Uh, the House may or may not be aware members of the ACT Party today lodged some 700 questions to members. Standing Order 370 sets no limit for questions to members. However, members in lodging so many questions run the risk of limits being placed on the number of such questions and in doing so, and in so doing, adversely affecting other members with genuine issues they want to pursue. The questions have been scrutinised by the clerk's office. Questions to a chairperson must relate to a matter before the committee and a process or procedure for which the chairperson has responsibility. The responsibilities of chairpersons relate to limited areas of process and procedure. They are limited. First, in the absence of a, of committee making, in the absence of a committee making a decision about its next meeting, the chairperson may set the date for that meeting, but the chairperson does not control the agenda. This is a matter for members of the committee. Refer to standing, uh, to standing Order 186.2. The chairperson may, on bar, second, the chairperson may, on behalf of the committee, re request any person to attend and give evidence, and request papers and records be produced. Standing Order 291. Next, the chairperson may direct the examination of witnesses and question witnesses. Sta uh, standing Order 220. Next, the chairperson, with the agreement of the committee, may make a public statement to inform the public of the nature of a committee's consideration of a matter. Standing Order 238.1. And finally, the chairperson signs the committee reports and presents it. Uh, standing at Order 243. These are the extent of the chairperson's powers and set the limits for questions to chairpersons. Questions that ask about qu committee decisions are not in order. What is the committee currently considering, for example, or when will it consider a matter and not in order? The chairperson is no more responsible for such a decision than any other members of the committee. Furthermore, such decisions are more than likely to be confidential to the committee. Similarly, the chairperson is no more responsible for progress on an item of business than any other member of the committee. The fact that uh, such questions may have been allowed in the past does not make them in order now. The Speaker must rule whenever a question arises on the interpretation or application of the standing orders. The Speaker is guided by established speaking rulers, rulings. There is nothing in the rulings, though, that convinced me that the questions that I've ruled out today were in order. Uh, given the uh, number uh, of supplementary questions asked, I believe my actions were appropriate. And we therefore come to questions one, two, uh, if I can just... Uh, get myself organised here to deal with this large number of questions to members. Questions 1 to 20 uh, are addressed to the Chairperson of the Commerce Committee. Uh, it is my understanding that the Honourable Leanne Dalzell is not uh, present in the Chamber and those questions are therefore postponed. Questions 20... Uh, point of order, Honourable John Biscoe. I wonder if the Chair of the Select Committee uh, is not available. I wonder if those questions could be answered by the uh, Acting Chair. No, I've ruled that the, uh, the standing orders require that only the chair. The questions are addressed to the chair, and if the chair is not present, uh, the questions are postponed. 
Questions 21 to 40 are addressed to the Chairperson of the Finance and Expenditure Committee. Uh, it's my understanding that the Chair of the Finance and Expenditure Committee, Craig Foss, is not present in the Chamber, so questions 21 to 40 are postponed. Questions 41 to 44. Uh, point of order, Honourable John Biscarn. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'd like to refer you to um, Speaker's rulings, and I'll just get... Excuse me. I'd like you to refer you to... Thank, thank you, Mr Chair, Mr, Mr Speaker. I'd like you to refer you to Speaker's ruling uh, on page 150, paragraph 2. You've just ruled in respect of the questions to the Chair of the Commerce Select Committee that the chair, the question could not be put to the deputy chair, um, and I accepted that, Mr Chair. However, the issue arises about the deputy chair of the Finance and Expenditure Select Committee. Uh, Speaker's rulings 150-2 says that a question can be put to the deputy chair if the actual chair is overseas. Now, in the case of the Commerce Select Committee, I know that Sam loto Eager is not overseas, because I saw the government whip escort him from the House a short time ago. However, I don't know, I don't know order, that the order, Chair of the order, Finance this, Expenditure... Order. I'm on my feet and the member will resume his seat. Order. <laughs> the the uh, Speaker's ruling the member is referring to actually referring to the Chair being overseas. The member has got it somewhat wrong there. Questions 41. Can I have an assurance that Mr Foss is not overseas? I'd, I'd seek an ex a, a order. undertaking. Order. Order. The, uh, I'm satisfied the member is absent from the House and I don't believe the member is overseas and that's the end of the matter. Question 41 to 44 addressed the chairperson of the Government Administration Committee. Uh, the Honourable David Parker is chairperson of the Government Administration Committee. Uh, the Honourable David Parker is not present. Those questions are postponed. Questions 45 to 48 are addressed to the Chairperson of the Health Committee. Uh, the Chairperson is Dr Paul Hutchison. He is not present either. Questions 49 to 60 are addressed to the Chairperson of the Justice and Electoral Committee. Uh, Chester Borrows, is he present? He is not present. Those questions are postponed. Point order. Order. A point of order has been called. The Honourable John Biscard. Mr. Speaker. Order. The, the, Honourable John the members that have been called have been on notice for the last couple of hours. These questions have been lodged. So, and I don't think it's acceptable that that members who are select committee chairs choose to absence in themselves from the house this afternoon because there's questions set down for them, sir. And I and I'd ask you to rule that the order. Order. The Speaker is not responsible for members can be uh, attending to important parliamentary business. I'm sure it's just as important as the 700 questions lodged. <laughs> questions, questions 61 to 64. I'm dealing with questions 61 to 64. Does, does the point of order relate to those questions? Well, it, it does, sir, to the, the extent John that you, you've just had a, a, a crack or a snide remark at the questions that we've raised, sir. And, and I think that the questions should be dealt with some decorum. And I don't think that the remarks that you made were, were, were reasonable, sir. Order. A point of order is being heard. And if I, if I did not have suitable decorum, I apologise to the member. Questions 61 to 64 are addressed to the chairperson of the Social Services Committee. Uh, the chairperson, I understand, is Katrina Shanks. Is she present in the chamber? She is not present. Those questions are postponed. Point of order, the Honourable John Biscard. Sir, reflecting then on Speaker's rulings um, 150-2, can we have an assurance that Katrina Shanks is not overseas? Because if she's overseas, the, uh, according to Speaker's rulings 150-2, uh, we'd be entitled to have that question answered by the Deputy Chair. Order. Members are not entitled to refer to the absence of, or seek uh, questions about why members are absent from the Chamber. That's not consistent with standing orders. Uh, we deal with questions. A point of order, John Biscarn. Sir, so you have to help me because I read, I read <laughs> Speaker's ruling 150-2 and what that says is acceptable for the, chair, the question to be put down to the Deputy Chair if the Chair is overseas. Now, clearly, sir, that, it, it, that, that there is relevance as to where the Chair is well, because order. if the Chair is overseas, uh, I'm entitled, sir, according to Speaker's rulings... Order, I'm to on my feet. Now, the member, if the member was serious about his questions being asked, he would ascertain whether or not a chair is overseas. 
Uh, that is not that difficult. He could have done that quite easily himself. Um, if, it can, if, it, uh, if it helps solve the problem for the Honourable Member, though, I can, I can check with the, with the government whip. Is uh, Katrina Shanks uh, into the point of uh, overseas? Or, uh, I'll hear first. Uh, point of order, Mr Carter. Speaker. I can assure the House that none of these people who are absent are overseas. I thank the Honourable Member. Questions 65 to 68 are addressed to the Chairperson uh, of the Transport and Industrial Relations Committee. The Chairperson is David Bennett. Is David Bennett present in the Chamber? Those questions are therefore postponed. Questions 69 to 70 addressed to the member in charge of the Hamilton City Council Piranha Park Land Vesting Bill. The member in charge of that bill is David Bennett. Is David Bennett present in the chamber? David Bennett is not present in the chamber. Those questions are therefore postponed. Questions 71 and 72 are addressed to the member in charge of the Royal Society of New Zealand Amendment Bill. That member is Grant Robertson. Is Grant Robertson present. Grant Robertson is not present in the chamber. Those questions are therefore postponed. Questions 73 to 75. Questions 73 to 75 are addressed to the member in charge of the Education Freedom of Association Bill, the Honourable Heather Roy, and I invite the Honourable John Biscowan to ask question 73. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the chair. Sorry, is to the uh, member in charge of the Education Freedom of Association Amendment Bill, and asks, what is the purpose of the Education Freedom of Association Amendment Bill? The Honourable Heather Roy. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> the purpose of the bill is to uphold students' rights to freedom of association by removing any requirement for students to join students' associations. Question 74, the Honourable John... Mr. Speaker. I don't intend to allow a supplementary on that. Uh, the, the question was answered very clearly. Question 74, the Honourable John Biscowan. Uh, 